Jeff has led the office to continue to do great things and maintain its reputation for independence and excellence. Under Jeff's leadership, the office has continued its focus on sophisticated financial crime. He led the prosecution of Congressman Christopher Collins for insider trading and recently charged the head of uh, the Abraj Group, a $13 billion private equity firm with lying to investors about the firm's finances and pocketing hundreds of millions of dollars. Leading the battle against the opioid epidemic, Jeff, in a first of its kind prosecution, has charged the CEO and CCO of a pharmaceutical distributor, Rochester Drug Cooperative, as well as the distributor itself, with drug trafficking and defrauding the DEA for their role in the distribution of oxycodone and fentanyl. Jeff has also protected the city's most underprivileged. He pursued the New York City Housing Authority for failing to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing, resulting in an administrative agreement that has placed NYCHA under the supervision of a federal monitor, Bart Schwartz, who's here, and required it to remedy the living conditions of its residents, including lead paint, mold, pest infestations, and lack of heat. In addition to protecting the city's underprivileged, he has also protected our nation's sneaker companies from extortion by television personalities like Michael Avenetti. <laughs> Under Jeff's leadership, the Southern District has been a port in the storm for citizens that are wanting to believe that there are still institutions in this country that are unaffected by partisan politics. Prior to assuming his post, Jeff was a partner at the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. He served for three years in the office of the Independent Counsel, investigating the Iran-Contra affair, and then as, a, as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. He clerked on the Third Circuit and is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as Stanford Law School. Now, alums of the Southern District of New York are well familiar with the long-standing practice of what is known as shatsing your case. No Southern District Assistant U.S. Attorney has ever commenced a trial without an email going out from one of his colleagues, his or her colleagues, that are speaking of the monumental task that this AUSA is about to face. Reading this email from the trial advocate's colleague, no trial could be harder to win, so that when the case is in fact won, it could only have been due to the power of the AUSA's soaring oration, the strategic brilliance of that advocate. And that is shatsing a case. And no one would ever do anything to raise expectations or predict a positive outcome. And so I am about to do to Jeff Berman what no AUSA has ever done. I am going to raise expectations. I will tell you that among Jeff Berman's closest friends is Richard Appel, a former assistant United States attorney, but far more importantly, the executive producer of the animated sitcom, The Family Guy. Rich Appel knows funny, and he has been quoted as saying, Jeff is one of the funniest guys I know. I guess we shall see. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Berman. Well, I was going to thank Michael for his uh, kind introduction, but um, at this point, I don't think so, Michael. I, uh, raising expectations like that is, uh, as you say, it's, it's, not the, it's not the Southern District way, and you should know better. But I, do, uh, I would like to thank Michael uh, for uh, the introduction and uh, for inviting me to speak this afternoon. The New York White Collar Bar has a nationally and internationally renowned reputation. It's been that uh, at the time that I was uh, admitted to the bar and stays that way today. And it is my great privilege to be speaking before you this afternoon. I applaud the City Bar Association for organizing the White Collar Institute, which allows 
every year you all to gather in an informal setting to discuss uh, the issues that most concern you. I see that Michael is participating in the last panel of the day, which is entitled, quote, Finding the Line, the Ever-Expanding Scope of Wire Fraud Liability. Now, I haven't read his remarks, but spoiler alert, I bet he doesn't think the line is where the Southern District thinks the line is. <laughs> and uh, Michael, presumably, will try to keep the other panelists in line. One of those panelists is uh, Judge Rakoff. So, Michael, hope springs eternal. <laughs> I see that my uh, friend and former colleague, uh, Rob Kazami, is also on a panel this afternoon. As you may know, Rob has left his position as Deputy uh, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York and is now in the midst of an extensive job search. <laughs> Not going great. <laughs> um, so if any of you know of any jobs <laughs> or, or even any leads uh, for any jobs, please, please let Rob know, not during these remarks, but maybe during uh, Michael's panel. <laughs> Is that good enough for you, Rob? Okay. Uh, at last year's White Collar Institute, we heard speeches from my friends Rod Rosenstein and Steve Pekin, both of whom are outstanding lawyers and public servants. They use this forum to announce new policies. Well, in spite of the reputation of the Southern District of New York, we do not set policy. Therefore, I will not be announcing any new initiatives. Even so, I hope to be as entertaining as Rob and Steve were. And I was here last year for their talks, and they didn't exactly set the bar on humor that high. <laughs> now, I should note, as background, that I spent the bulk of my uh, first stint in public service investigating and prosecuting white collar cases. When I left the U.S. Attorney's Office in the mid-1990s, I felt with some satisfaction that I had essentially eliminated serious white collar crime. <laughs> Therefore, when I entered private practice, I was concerned that I might not have much to do. And in fact, I ended up feeling like I suppose many of you here must feel that prosecutors investigating white collar matters were overly aggressive and often criminalize conduct that, if it is problematic at all, should really be dealt with civilly. Imagine my surprise then when I returned as U.S. attorney and discovered that white-collar crime still exists and that it manifests itself in novel ways. That means that you and your clients need to understand that my office intends to continue to investigate and prosecute white-collar crimes aggressively this is good news as far as this group is concerned. The reality of new and different types of white collar work means that you should re all remain busy for the foreseeable future. This afternoon, I want to discuss two types of investigations and prosecutions that barely existed two decades ago that we are now pursuing with increased frequency, criminal sanctions enforcement and cybercrime. As you may have heard, the Southern District of New York has taken an expansive view of its venue. I recall seeing one of my predecessors present an award in the form of a globe, which she explained represented our view of the office's venue. The reality is that changes in the world have made that remark, perhaps in jest, much truer. The world is a smaller, or at least more interconnected place in terms of criminal conduct, and accordingly in terms of the work that we do and the work that you do. The work of the office has become increasingly international. I will not try to cover all aspects of our international work, but instead one aspect which is premised entirely on overseas conduct that violates sanctions imposed by the U.S. government. Our ability to pursue these cases is a result of the weaponization of the dollar. That is, our ability to use the structural supremacy of the dollar to impose sanctions to achieve foreign policy objectives. Historically, sanctions were primary in nature. Our government would impose a trade embargo that prohibited U.S. citizens or residents or U.S. companies or organizations from transacting business with a government, institution, or individual of a specified foreign country. Cuba and Iran 
are examples of countries subjected to U.S. trade embargoes. Prior primary sanctions go all the way back to the passage in 1917 of the Trading with the Enemy Act. In 1977, Congress passed the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or IEPA, which authorized the President to declare a national emergency in response to unusual and extraordinary foreign threats to our national security, foreign policy, or economy, and to restrict commerce, including commerce with a foreign country, to respond to that threat. More recently, in roughly the last 10 years, Congress began to pass legislation designed to ratchet up pressure on sanctioned, com on sanctioned com uh, countries by prohibiting non-U.S. citizens and companies from transacting business with those countries. Among other things, this legislation authorized the Treasury Department to impose what is commonly known as secondary sanctions, which bar foreign banks and other entities from accessing the U.S. financial system if those entities have dealt with certain sanctioned governments, entities, or individuals. Sanctioned governments appear on the State Department's state sponsors of terrorism list, the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, also maintains a list of sanctioned entities and, individu and individuals. These secondary sanctions essentially force foreign banks and businesses to make a choice. They can either do business with the United States or do business with a hostile foreign government, but they cannot do business with both. The law also prohibits foreign companies from conspiring to evade or avoid these secondary sanctions. Because they are far broader, broader in scope, secondary sanctions obviously exert much more pressure on targeted countries than simple primary sanctions. Consequently, they have become important tools in U.S. foreign policy. By opting to use secondary sanctions as tools of foreign policy and pressing for aggressive enforcement of those sanctions, our government has vastly expanded the reach of U.S. law enforcement. Because virtually all dollar transactions at some point pass through Manhattan, this change in policy has created venue for an enormous amount of sanctions work by the Southern District of New York. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that this office has recently brought significant cases arising out of sanctions violations and that we are continuing to do so. I will mention just a few. In 2014, BNP Paribas pleaded guilty to felony information charging BNPP with knowingly and willfully conspiring to commit violations of IEPA and the Trading with the Enemy Act from 2004 to 2012 by providing dollar clearing services to individuals and, uh, and, and entities associated with Sudan, Iran, and Cuba. BNPP paid total financial penalties to federal and state, law, uh, state authorities of almost $9 billion. More recently, in November 2018, the office entered into a deferred prosecution agreement with Societe Generale for its role in processing billions of dollars of transaction using the U.S. financial system in connection with credit facilities involving Cuba. As part of the resolution of the matter, SOCGEN agreed to pay penalties of over $1.3 billion to federal and state prosecutors and regulators. Sanctioned prosecutions are not restricted to banks and entities. In early 2018, Hakan Attila, an executive of a Turkish bank, was convicted after trial in the Southern District of New York of conspiring to violate the Iranian sanctions to deceive the Treasury Department in order to avoid the imposition of secondary sanctions and to defraud U.S. financial institutions and launder money by concealing transactions with the government of Iran and other Iranian entities. Attila is presently serving a sentence of 32 months in prison. His conviction is on appeal. And just last Thursday, in a one-of-its-kind sanctions case, the Southern District of New York announced the seizure of a 72,000-ton cargo vessel named the Wise Honest. We allege that the ship had been used by the North Korean government to circumvent U.S. sanctions by transporting coal from North Korea to foreign entities. The ship was seized about as far away as you can get from the Southern District of New York and is now in port in American Samoa. Coincidentally, 
the wise honest is my self-designated nickname at the office. <laughs> it hasn't, hasn't really caught on. The Southern District will continue to pursue criminal sanctions enforcement vigorously. With that future in mind, I have three recommendations for you. First, sanction cases like the BNPP and SOCGEN often involve large private sector actors. As those cases make clear, the stakes are high. My strong recommendation is that as a general matter, you counsel your corporate or institutional clients on instituting, maintaining, and updating a state-of-the-art sanctions compliance program. For example, it is critically important that institutions ensure both that their overseas employees are fully aware of the requirements of the U.S. sanctions regime and that complete and transparent information is provided to U.S. affiliates or branches and their compliance personnel. In that vein, our experience has been that sanctions violations, both willful and otherwise, have generally occurred when foreign institutions conceal facts relating to their transactions from U.S. personnel or limit U.S. access to information about overseas customers. Therefore, in addition to making sure that employees are trained about U.S. sanctions laws, banks and other entities must make sure that their systems provide sufficient transparency so that employees can ensure that they are not violating U.S. sanctions. Second, because sanctions work has become criminal white-collar work rather than simply work done by lawyers specializing in international trade, there is a great need for your clients to have the benefit of your white-collar expertise. Accordingly, and you will like this, I recommend that in, my, in any case involving possible violations of U.S. sanctions, you recommend to your clients that they have white-collar U.S. counsel present. Third, the international nature of sanctions enforcement work means that we will be looking to your clients for sometimes atypical forms of cooperation. For your clients, different laws governing the transfer of data, like European data privacy laws or Swiss banking secrecy laws, may affect the manner in which your clients provide information. We understand that there may be limitations on what you're able to provide, but we expect you to be clear and straightforward with us about those limitations. In other words, in order to gain appropriate credit for cooperation, it is important for you to be transparent early in investigation about these issues. As you know, all investigations in the Southern District of New York place a priority on identifying individuals responsible for criminal misconduct and prosecuting those individuals, whether they are here or overseas. You should not let my references to corporations or institutions lead you to believe otherwise. The Attila prosecution I had discussed earlier is a case in point. We indicted several overseas individuals in that case. So if you are representing an individual, then my advice is the same. Do not believe that we will ignore criminal conduct on the part of individuals in which the United States has an interest just because those individuals are overseas. And communicate with us early and openly so that your individual clients can receive appropriate credit for their cooperation. I would like to turn now to another type of work that also has a strong international footprint and has grown tremendously and promises to continue to grow the investigation and prosecution of cybercrime. The development of the cyber universe represents one of the most fundamental changes we have experienced in our lifetimes. There is not a single aspect of our lives that is not governed or at least heavily influenced by cyber technology, and by that I mean uh, computers or the internet. Accordingly, for the Southern District of New York and for this group, there is not a single aspect of our work that is not affected to some extent by cyber technology. This was not the case even a relatively few years ago. When I served as an assistant United States attorney, the World Wide Web was newly created. Few of us in the U.S. Attorney's Office had much familiarity with it. I was fortunate to be involved in the office's first significant hacking case, the Masters of Destruction prosecution, which featured the nation's first wiretap to capture keystrokes and resulted in the nation's first significant prison sentence for a hacker. While the Masters of Destruction case was significant and cutting edge at the time, it is light years away from today's challenges. 
when we talk about cybercrime, we're really talking about both cybercrime and cyber-enabled crime. Cybercrime, strictly speaking, refers to various forms of hacking into computer systems and databases. Cyber-enabled crime refers to traditional criminal conduct that has been enabled by cyber technology. Examples include the use of the dark web to sell narcotics or transmit child pornography. Historically, cybercrime could be characterized broadly as follows. Conduct related to national security, for example, hacking sponsored by foreign governments. For profit hacking, hacking often conducted by organized crime groups designed to generate profit through the use of stolen data. An example would be ransomware attacks in which the hackers threaten either to disclose the data or destroy the data unless a ransom is paid. Hacktivism, which is hacking like that conducted by the well-known amorphous group Anonymous, which purports to hack in support of a cause. And dark web and use of cryptocurrency, which offer a hidden and protected venue for criminal behaviors like the sale of narcotics and the laundering of money. Your clients are most likely to be victimized by the first two categories, hacking related to national security and hacking for profit. However, cybercrime now routinely touches more than one of these categories. For example, recognizing that the data held in institutional or personal computer systems is very valuable, hackers will steal the data and then offer to sell it to other actors, nation states or other criminal groups or even hacktivists. We are dealing with all manner of actors who are using cyber technologies to commit all manner of crime. In fact, one of the trends that we are seeing in our investigation is the use of the dark web marketplaces for hiring hackers and selling user-friendly toolkits for hacking into computer systems. In either case, the people seeking to hire a hacker or to purchase hacking tools need not themselves be sophisticated. They simply, want, they simply have to want to engage in cybercrime. The upshot is that the dark web is making it easier for criminals to become cyber criminals. As we all know, private sector companies are frequently the targets of hacking and the related criminal activity that flows from that hacking. Their servers are compromised and looted of the valuable data they contain. Because those private sector companies are the victims of this criminal behavior and the source of evidence that we need, we need the prompt and complete cooperation of private sector victims. Too often, though, the private sector resists cooperating fully with us, and I would like to identify and dispel three myths that inhibit public-private cooperation in the investigation of cybercrime. As I will explain, your clients will benefit from that collaboration, and you are in the best position to carry that message to your clients. So the first myth is that private sector victims of cyber attacks private sector victims of cyber attacks often believe that law enforcement authorities will take over their networks and demand access to sensitive company materials. And that is simply wrong. We do not require or demand direct access to company servers. Data that is required to advance a cyber investigation often consists of non-content log data, which is data that reflects access to and malicious activity on the network, but that does not include sensitive company content itself. We can work efficiently with IT personnel to carve out the data we actually need and with the company counsel to cover the requested data with appropriate legal process. Where an outside third party vendor is brought to assist a company with investigating an incident, the vendor frequently collects logs and other forensic data that we need, granting quick access to the logs and forensic data to law enforcement can frequently satisfy our initial need for data to help advance an investigation into the perpetrators of the attack. That's the first myth. The second myth is that private sector companies often believe, understandably but mistakenly, that law enforcement authorities will share with regulators information that we collect regarding a cyber breach. This misconception is understandable because there are an ever-increasing number of regulators investigating data breaches, including the Federal Trade Commission, 
state's attorneys general, and the New York State Department of Financial Services. And as we all know, in many other types of investigations, there is considerable sharing of data among agencies. So long as that data is not subject to some limitation on disclosure, like data protected by criminal rule of criminal procedure uh, 6E or, or uh, trade secret information that might be protected by statute. However, cyber investigations differ from these other investigations in material ways. For one thing, federal law enforcement agencies view companies recovering from intrusions as victims that de deserve protection. We do not share with regulators information that we gather in an intrusion, and when approached by regulators, we refer them to the victim itself for more information. Moreover, when asked by a company, we are willing to validate to regulators that the company's cooperation with our ongoing criminal investigation. And such validation is valuable to the company. The FTC has issued guidance indicating that it will likely view more favorably a company that has suffered a data breach if that company cooperated with criminal and other law enforcement agencies in their efforts to apprehend the individuals responsible for the intrusion. It is also worth pointing out that cooperation often strengthens the company's position with shareholders, insurers, lawmakers, the media, and others. In other words, far from exposing a company to other hostile investigations, our work with that company in response to a data breach can turn out to be an asset for the company. The third myth is that the private sector often views information flow as a one-way street. In their view, law enforcement authorities will not share with victims the information collected in the course of an investigation. And this is not accurate. We do not want our partnership with the private sector to be a one-way street. Where it is allowed, we make our best efforts to provide information to private sector victims. Admittedly, there is likely to be information that we cannot share. However, we can often tell victims more about what data was stolen. We may also be able to provide information from other similarly situated victims without identifying those victims that will assist companies in remediating and protecting themselves against future intrusions. In certain instances, we can provide context for the threat and educate senior management, sometimes in classified settings with cleared personnel about the threat so that they can better understand the hacker and the intruder. We're done in classified settings we strive to provide unclassified tear lines, which are specially unclassified sections of classified reports that will provide clear direction as to what information can be shared more broadly with network defenders of the company. To make this more concrete, let me give you an example of a cyber investigation in which there was an expeditious and mutually beneficial sharing of information between private sector actors and my office and the FBI. In 2018, we announced charges against nine hackers associated with the Iran-based Mabda Institute, which, according to the charges in the indictment, conducted extensive hacking campaigns, including into U.S. universities, on behalf of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. During the investigation of hacks into U.S. universities, data obtained from a handful of U.S. universities allowed us to understand the computer network infrastructure used by the Mabda Institute for, to facilitate the attacks. Legal process on that infrastructure, including both domestic legal process and MLAT requests, allowed us to find evidence of other servers used by the Mabda Institute to facilitate its attacks, as well as indications that the attacks were far more widespread, impacting thousands of other specific professor accounts at 144 U.S. universities. We worked to provide specific notice to impacted universities regarding accounts that were detected as being compromised at their universities. General notice to the university community at large with information regarding malicious domains and IP addresses that were used by the Mabna Institute for their attacks. And general information about the attacks, techniques, and procedures used by the Mabna Institute to assist IT, IT departments at those universities. In addition, the investigation revealed widespread hacks of private sector companies and government entities that were conducted through a specific technique called password spraying and targeted a specific configuration of Windows Office 365. 
Prior to the indictment being unsealed, we coordinated with Microsoft to help Microsoft release its own security advisory to customers and arrange for the release of an FBI flash message warning the public about specific tactics and threats. Cyber investigations represent a new type of work for my office and I su suspect for many of you. It is important to understand that the dynamic of that work differs significantly from traditional white collar work. In that regard, it is important for you to educate your clients who may be the victims of cyber attacks that their preconceived notions of what it means to share information with the government are mistaken. I hope that you are persuaded that it is an important, in the case of a cyber attack, for you to encourage the prompt sharing of information with law enforcement authorities, close collaboration, allows private sector actors to better protect their networks, and allows us to identify and warn them and others of future malicious activities. In closing, I would like to thank Michael and the City Bar Association for inviting me to speak here this afternoon. I trust that it does not surprise you to hear me say that we will continue to pursue white collar investigations aggressively in both our traditional areas and in newer areas like sanctions, enforcement, and cybercrime. As I am sure you will agree, in all of these areas, including the two I focused on today, your clients will benefit from your white collar expertise. Thank you very much.